All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about diabetes type 2, why probiotics don't work. Now, recently I've been talking about the liver and connections to gut bacteria. Tonight I'm going to delve further into uh, diabetes type 2 and the gut bacterial relationship and associations with probiotics. As the world of the microbiome uh, seems to expand and more and more knowledge is getting out to the lay public regarding how our gut affects our systemic health, uh, more and more people have this thought process to take probiotics. And that's a natural thought process because you're being advertised to all the time, uh, saying take this probiotic, take that probiotic, and many of you are kind of wondering what is what and maybe what is the science showing. So that's what I'm trying to go through tonight. And I'm just going to type in good evening to everyone joining. Thank you for coming along with me. It's, it's late here on the West Coast. Uh, so anyways, without further ado, uh, I'll bring this slide in. So this is the title for tonight, Pro Diabetes Type 2, Why Probiotics Don't Work. Um, okay, so we're going to hide that one, show this one, and we'll reverse it. So much of the uh, discussion I'll go over tonight comes from this journal article. It's a nice synopsis. It is a little bit old. It's from 2017 from Diabetologia where they're talking about the gut microbiome as a target for prevention and treatment of hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar, and type 2 diabetes from current human evidence to future possibilities. And so in this article, they go through a myriad of the 600 plus studies um, published at that point in time. Uh, they, they comment that a lot of the work on type 2 diabetes in the gut has been done in animal models. Um, which sometimes translates to humans, other times completely does not translate to humans. Animals serve as a nice uh, observational piece for scientists because they can explore a lot of hypotheses and control for a number of factors, including genetics, very easily. Um, and then in this article, they say that the human studies were sparse, but they did have some conclusions that they could go through. And I'll go through those for you uh, simply. And then I'll talk about a brand new study um, looking at the effects of probiotics on type 2 diabetes. So uh, that is what we have. Um, let me bring this one in. Okay, so this is a really nice diagram from that article in Diabetologia where they talk about your genetics and how your genetics can affect your gut bacteria, the composition of your gut bacteria. If you have any questions on that, go back and watch my rheumatoid arthritis and Prevotella uh, broadcast. Great information regarding how uh, the genetics of someone with rheumatoid arthritis basically predisposes them to have overabundance of certain bacteria in their gut. And that may have significance for their disease process, it may not. But we are now learning how genetics not only interplay with the disease, but they interplay with our susceptibility to overgrowth of certain bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract. So pretty cool. Um, we know that diet and medications can affect the, the microbiome. We know that surgery can affect the microbiome. Uh, and what can we do to prevent or treat this issue? So we have dietary changes, probiotics that's being kicked around, uh, genetically modified therapies, glucose lowering drugs, fecal microbial transplant. That was a really popular topic a few years ago. Uh, basically, the early studies were in mice, and in essence, they would take the feces out of a thin mouse, translocate that feces into an obese mouse, and all of a sudden, the obese mouse would become thin. So studies such as that really fostered a lot of interest in the microbiome. And so um, fecal microbial transplant is a thing. Interestingly, in the United States, it's largely only used in research studies or in gastroenterology clinics uh, where they may be treating something like C. diff 
uh, Clostridium difficile as it's known, or it may be used for inflammatory bowel conditions, but it's not so easy to get your hands on it, which is why maybe some people are traveling uh, to other countries to get their fecal microbial transplants. So I just like this diagram that they have in the article because it really helps you to kind of see what's going on. Um, and so we'll hide that one and then let's bring this one in. So what do we know about the human evidence? Not the evidence from mice, but the human evidence. We do know that in diabetes, there is a reduction in butyrate producing bacteria. What is butyrate? So butyrate, uh, commonly referred to as beta hydroxybutyrate, is a short chain fatty acid that is thought to have really beneficial properties for healthy gut bacteria, healthy gastrointestinal lining. Um, because of that finding, a lot of people started consuming a lot of butter because butter is rich in a product called butyrophilin and butyrophilin will be directly converted to beta hydroxybutyrate if there's the right uh, intestinal microbiome milieu, so to speak. So anyways, what we do know is that butyrate, this good short chain fatty acid is reduced in type two diabetes. We also know that there's a reduction in acromanesia, mucinophila, if I pronounce that right. So acromanesia species are reduced. And we also see an increased serum uh, branch chain fatty acids from Prevotella corpori and uh, I can't remember, this is a uh, Bacteroides vulgaris, I, I believe. Uh, we do know that glucose lowering medications such as metformin, metformin its mechanism of action has recently come under a lot of question. Uh, originally, it was thought that metformin worked largely in your liver and how your liver was releasing glucose. We're now learning that metformin has huge impacts on your intestinal barrier, uh, maybe in a, a very positive way. And I'm not recommending it to you, I'm just trying to give you the science on it. Metformin is thought to alter the gut microbiome. So they've seen that lactobacillus species as well as Escherichia uh, species, you know that as like E. coli type bacteria, but Escherichia species are far beyond, there's many different ones besides E. coli. Uh, those species increase lactobacillus and Escherichia uh, with taking metformin. And so that's always something that researchers have to be really aware of and studying this relationship between the gut bacteria and type 2 diabetes because we know that certain medications used for diabetes are affecting the gut bacteria. So lots of times now when you're when you're looking at the research, if you're doing that, you'll see that they're using type 2 diabetic patients who are treatment naive. They haven't been put on any specific therapy um, for that. And good evening to everyone who's joining as well. Uh, Thank you all for, for watching. So other pieces of this are diet. So diet can increase Prevotella with a high fiber diet in some individuals. One of the classic things to look at, I haven't talked about it in a while, is the Hadza tribe. The Hadza tribe is uh, one of the most well-researched groups on the planet. I believe they're in the African Congo or near the Congo. And in certain phases of their of their season, um, meaning I believe it's the rainy season where they eat upwards of 130 grams of fiber a day. So they eat largely a vegetarian diet. They're eating a lot of tubers as they're termed, tons of fiber dense foods, 130 grams of fiber, and they're thought to have the healthiest microbiome on the planet. Interestingly, as the seasons change and it becomes drier, they tend to eat more animal products and when they do that, their microbiome shifts again to not as healthy of a composition. So from that, a lot of researchers are talking about, well, maybe a big aspect of type 2 diabetes, where we see that the bacteria of diabetics is different from the bacteria of people who don't have diabetes. And we know how pieces of bacteria may be breaking off, causing this thing called subclinical endotoxemia, which is creating insulin resistance. Maybe this is a consequence of maybe the Western lifestyle uh, consisting of not a lot of exercise, really starch rich foods and low fiber. So it's thought that maybe increasing fiber can improve your gut bacteria. 
And then the one of the most powerful examples is, of the gut microbiome and diabetes relationship is bariatric surgery. So what researchers have noticed, particularly when they were doing the Ruin Y gastric bypass surgery, where the small intestine was literally transected, cut out, is that there were immediate changes in the uh, in glucose function, immediate changes in hormones, and it seemed as though people were losing weight far faster then it could be explained by caloric restriction because this person was just eating less. And there have been a lot of studies on it, and even some research articles have stated that the one known cure for type 2 diabetes is bariatric surgery. So something else to keep in mind. Uh, they talk about future possibilities and challenges. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in so much depth because I want to go over this, this work from some this thing called the Primo trial. So we'll hide that. So the Primo study was done um, recently. It was conducted over 20 centers involving 566 participants. They double-blinded it, randomized placebo-controlled study where they were comparing placebo versus probiotics versus berberine versus berberine and probiotics. Berberine is a natural plant alkaloid um, from, uh, in Chinese medicine, they call it coptis chinensis, and it's been used for millennia, thousands of years for the treatment of diarrhea illnesses. And then recently when researchers were studying it uh, for, to see how it helped diarrhea, they, they all of a sudden realized that these individuals' blood sugar numbers were improving drastically. So at this point in time, the consensus on berberine is that it's really powerful for helping lipids, uh, so cholesterol, triglycerides. It seems to be helpful for uh, metabolic syndrome, seems to have an additive effect with diabetes medications. Um, the jury is still out in terms of comparison head-to-head -head with some diabetes medications. Uh, but then for conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, berberine has been shown to produce more light bursts in some studies than the standard metformin. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Polycystic ovarian syndrome has a strong insulin resistance component. I believe that's the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology 2014, if I remember right. So without, with all that being said, in this pre-mode study, they were really trying to say, okay, we know the gut bacteria have a strong relationship to type 2 diabetes. Let's do a study in treatment naive diabetics, 566 of them. So about 100 were in the placebo group, about 100 were because as you do a study, certain people get weeded out for whatever reason. Um, it's in the article, I won't go through that. So there's a probiotic arm, which is about 100 people, a berberine arm, which is about 100 people, and then berberine plus probiotic arm. And their primary outcome measure was the three-month measure of blood sugar called the HbA1c. And what they saw was that, in essence, probiotics didn't really do anything for blood sugar um, in, in comparison to placebo. So in essence, they were about the same. Interestingly, and I'll go through this probably in another uh, video, hopefully this week, what they saw is that berberine and berberine plus probiotics, these two groups were pretty similar. Their conclusion was that, in essence, it seems to be the berberine doing the trick, not the probiotics, because the probiotics were no more effective than placebo. And they were seeing, in some groups, nearly a percentage reduction in the HbA1c. So for context, uh, a normal hemoglobin A1c is between about generally 4.8% to 5.6%. If you're up around 6.5% and above, you're diabetic. Um, and a lot of these individuals were starting in the 7% range or mid 7%, so say around 7.5, and they were going down to around 6.5% just after 13 weeks. So a little, about three months of therapy with berberine or berberine pro plus probiotics. So pretty, pretty cool information for those of you who are investigating this relationship between the microbiome and type 2 diabetes. So. In summary, uh, it doesn't seem from this pre study that probiotics are effective. Now, 
maybe it was just the strain of probiotics they use. So maybe they need to use different species. And that's going to be a context of discussion. Um, there are some pretty formidable supplement companies now coming out asserting that their probiotics are really effective. I've seen uh, certainly probiotics be effective in certain situations. But again, the more we learn about the microbiome, the more everyone wants to jump towards what? The silver bullet, the one simple thing. And I will say, even in the context of all of this, a lot of the research on the microbiome says that diet is one of the most powerful ways to augment or change your gut bacteria. Think of the Hadza tribe. When they're eating 130 grams of fiber a day, their microbiome is drastically different than when they're eating fiber plus animal products or when they're eating more animal products in their diet. So uh, all of this is food for thought, pardon the pun. Let me know what you think. Uh, if you have information showing that probiotic, there's a probiotic therapy that I missed that is really markedly statistically significantly improving type 2 diabetes, let me know. But I haven't been able to find it. And this Primo study is pretty cool. It's pretty new. Uh, I think it's good. And when we're talking about a topic, you know, it's I try not just to pull from one study. But in this situation, again, there's not been a ton of human studies on this matter. So this is a good human study. And so that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention. So um, <laughs> good evening again to everyone who joined. I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday evening, and I will see you soon.